Across the ocean, where the sky meets the sea, most only saw the horizon. But the wayfinder could see and feel far more. He perceived another world entirely, one where the waves, winds, and stars spoke a language all their own. He voyaged across the open ocean in his canoe, over incredible distances, from one end of the earth to another, with those brave enough to sail with him. No maps, no compass, no books guide his way. But he is not afraid. He does not need them. For the sky above is his map, and the stars his compass. And even in the darkest of nights, when he could see nothing at all, he could still feel the ebb and flow of the currents beneath him. Their movement was like a story he could read, the shift and pull of the waves, a chart from which he could plot his way. He traveled across the Pacific as his people had done for generations. Thousands of years of knowledge passed from one master navigator to another, tracing back halfway across the world to the very first wayfinders. The Pacific had nurtured and spread life throughout its shores for millions of years. Plants and insects found new homes carried by its waves, sea life carried by its currents, birds carried by its winds. And thousands of years before, his ancestors built ocean-faring rafts from bamboo on which to traverse its waters. Perhaps they yearned for new land, sought earth from which they could farm anew. They wondered what lay over the horizon and imagined beyond their own shores. So they sailed out of Southeast Asia taught themselves how to read the winds and chase the ocean currents, how to map the sun and stars, decipher formations of birds and clouds as one would read an atlas. Over time, they mastered the art of building double-hulled canoes. They wove lengths of sail entirely by hand and carved seafaring hulls from trees Every vessel was crafted from the natural riches of the islands they discovered. These men and women were explorers and adventurers, courageous enough to venture into the unknown and skilled enough to survive and flourish on new lands. Over thousands of years, each generation traveled farther than the last. They discovered thousands of islands and the ocean connected rather than divided. By 700 years ago, they had reached Easter Island, Hawaii, and New Zealand. These people of the Pacific shared the ocean, its water, its winds, its sky, a vast world that one might simply call Oceania. But long ocean crossing voyages became less of a necessity as these island nations grew to become self-sustaining. Eventually, the people of Oceania would no longer sail across the ocean, that the wayfinding knowledge that once was fundamental to their way of life would fade from cultural memory. The deep knowledge built over thousands of years was broken. And as this wayfinder sailed by the sunset those hundreds of years ago, traveling home to the Hawaiian Islands from Tahiti, he could not have known this would be his last voyage, the last voyage of his people. Not for another 600 years would his descendants sail again. And until that time, these voyages and those of his ancestors all of their adventures and travels. These would only be stories.
By the mid 20th century, the wayfinding knowledge that once connected the people of Oceania was all but lost, as ocean crossing voyages had largely stopped centuries before. For some, the stories of these epic voyages were more the stuff of legend than of history. To reaffirm Polynesia's voyaging heritage and revive a forgotten tradition, the Polynesian Voyaging Society was founded by native Hawaiian artist Herb Kane, sailor Tommy Holmes, and anthropologist Ben Finney in 1973. Kane spent two years designing a vessel in the spirit of the double-hulled canoes used centuries ago, with a plan to sail it from Hawaii to Tahiti in the wake of their ancestors, without modern navigation instrumentation. It took two years to build their traditionally designed canoe, and in the summer of 1975, it was finished. Hokulea was named after the Star of Joy also called Arcturus, a star that passes directly over the islands of Hawaii in its path across the night sky. But though they had built a canoe on which to sail to Tahiti, they still lacked the navigational knowledge of their ancestors. The Polynesian Voyaging Society asked one of the few remaining wayfinders in the Pacific, Mao Piailuk, from the far away Micronesian island of Satawa to guide Hokulea from Hawaii to Tahiti in the traditional way. Mao had spent a lifetime studying navigation by the waves, winds, and stars in his part of the world, thousands of miles west of Hawaii. Recognizing that the wayfinding art was in danger of being lost entirely, Mao agreed to help the Polynesian Voyaging Society raise Tahiti from the sea. In the spring of 1976, they had a canoe and a navigator to guide her. So they embarked on a voyage that hadn't been attempted in centuries. And Mao was able to successfully navigate Hokulea, 2,600 miles from Hawaii to Tahiti. He showed that it was still possible to navigate thousands of miles of open ocean without modern instruments. A young Hawaiian named Nainoa Thompson was particularly inspired by this accomplishment. Amazed by Mao's ability to find his way using only the elements of nature as his tools, he sought to learn for himself the ways of navigation. He eventually convinced Mao to return to Hawaii and share his wayfinding knowledge. Uh, if you look at this ocean horizon, this, uh Imagine you're not on land, imagine you're at sea, and there's this 360-degree circle of water. When the sun goes down, then we have these amazing points of light that are millions of years old and millions of miles away, these points of light that we call stars. The stars help us create the shape of the sky that we know where to sail under. Nainoa spent countless hours with Mao in the late 1970s. He carefully studied the movements of the stars and explored techniques that would get him from Hawaii to Tahiti and back. Mao shared with Nainoa a technique he used to determine direction, a traditional star compass based on the rising and setting points of stars in his region of Micronesia. Nainoa used this as inspiration to develop a system that would work in any part of the vast Pacific. This would eventually become known as the Hawaiian Star Compass, a system that divides the horizon into 32 equal houses. In this compass, Hikina points east, Hema south, Komohana west, and Akau north. The houses situated between the four cardinal directions are La, Aina, Noyo, Manu, Nalani, Na Leo and Haka. The east and west portions of the star compass mirror each other, so that a star rising in southeast Manu will set in southwest Manu, or a star rising in southeast Aina will set in southwest Aina, and so on. 
Using Nainoa's system, it is possible to find direction by memorizing the houses in which particular stars live. Stars are most useful when they are rising or setting. As they move higher into the sky, it is more difficult to determine direction, and a navigator must seek out new stars near the horizon. Modern navigators memorize the houses of over 200 stars across the night sky. Nainoa's work to once again make the night sky relevant to Hawaiians inspired others to do the same. Years later, Hawaiian scholars at the University of Hawaii developed what they called the Hawaiian star families. Na ohana hoku eha. These families divide the sky into four segments that run north to south. Three of the four families can be seen throughout the course of a single night at any time of year. By memorizing the families and each of their members, a navigator can find the positions of all the other stars, even when some are obscured by clouds. The stars are just one of many tools used in traditional navigation. Throughout a voyage when skies are clear and a heading can be found by the sun and stars, a navigator heeds the direction of the wind and ocean swells. Understanding wind and current patterns allows them to feel their heading, even in the absence of visual cues. You know, Mao is really the, he's the ancient one. He's the complete navigator. He's the full navigator. And we're just students of him. He'd tell me stories about his grandfather on the voyaging canoe. He'd say, when I'm on the canoe, the wave make the canoe go up and down, and the canoe make me sick. My grandfather tie my hands with the rope, throw me into the ocean, and drag me in the ocean. This is five years old, by the way. When he throw me in the ocean, my grandfather make me go inside the wave. When I go inside the wave, I become the wave. When I become the wave, then I navigate. A wayfinder is mindful of the subtle clues that reveal islands just beyond the horizon. From hundreds of miles away, clouds can be seen forming over mountainous areas. Swell patterns change as ocean currents flow around large islands. Birds can be spotted flying towards land as they return to their nests after searching for food at sea. After two years of studying the waves, winds, and stars under Mao's guidance, Nainoa successfully navigated to Tahiti in 1980. In doing so, he became the first Hawaiian in centuries to navigate in this way, and an ancient tradition was born again. Hokulea's warm and excited welcome into Papayete Harbor symbolized a reconnection of Hawaiians and Tahitians through voyaging, a tradition that had faded over time. And this journey did more than just revive voyaging traditions. Hokulea's return from Tahiti sparked the beginning of a Hawaiian cultural renaissance. There was revived interest in Hawaiian language, chants, stories, dance, and a renewed sense of pride among the Hawaiian people. These early voyages to Tahiti were just the beginning. 
The Polynesian Voyaging Society continued to reconnect with other island nations over the next several decades. They sailed Hokulea to every corner of Polynesia, including New Zealand in 1985 and Easter Island in 1999. And in 2007, Hokulea made a symbolic voyage to Mao's home in Satawal to thank him for all that he had done to help revive the voyaging tradition in Polynesia. From there, Hokulea continued westward, and it wasn't long before she reached another Pacific island nation, Japan. He came with aloha, because he wanted to unite together. We work together. I didn't really know what to expect with Japan, and I was just more than happy that we did go there. She came to Okinawa. We visited very sacred places, and they shared their, their temples and their stories. And okay. Let me put your name on you. You really see how, how similar we are as people. Aloha, thank you so much. Hokulea's voyages had renewed a sense of community among the Hawaiian people. It was reconnecting the island nations of the Pacific, of Oceania. And this visit to Japan showed that it could forge connections across cultural boundaries as well. The Polynesian Voyaging Society was inspired to reach beyond the Pacific Ocean to cultures outside their ancestry. With the wind at their backs, they wanted to continue west and reach out to cultures all over the world. In the fall of 1992, as Nainoa sailed Hokulea across the Pacific, he spoke over satellite phone with an astronaut from Hawaii who was orbiting the Earth in the space shuttle Columbia. We think it's very important to, to speak about this because Hawaii would not have been settled with it. People didn't have the technology to uh, travel and explore by canoe with tools such as this. And uh, what we're doing today here in the base is literally just an extension of that human uh, spirit of adventure and exploration. Astronaut Lacey Veach shared with Nainoa the story of the first time he saw the Hawaiian Islands from above. He told Nainoa that you can never believe the beauty of the island Earth until you see it in its entirety. From 160 miles above the surface, he saw that the Earth was an island like Hawaii in the ocean of space. This reaffirmed to them both the importance of taking care of our planet as it is a life-giving home for all of humanity. They realized that the cultural knowledge that had enabled their ancestors to flourish on islands throughout the Pacific needed to be shared with the rest of the world. This inspired the mission for a worldwide voyage on Hokulea, to share practices for living sustainably and learn what others are doing, to bridge communities and together navigate toward a sustainable future. Malama Honua, to care for the earth. When we voyage, there has to be a respect for, for, for nature. The, the sea offers us gifts in, in terms of the fish that we can gather from it, uh, 
the rain that'll refuel our uh, empty water bottles. And our ancestors have cut a path that's, that's, that is on the ocean. Uh, it, it's ancestral, it's, uh, it's cultural, it's deep, it's old, and these young people need to go find it. It's the moment of departure. It's a difficult one. This voyage, if I can leave you with anything, is not about us. We leave for three years to find culture that is not defined by geography or nationalism, by ethnicity. It's about a culture, a new culture that needs to emerge on this earth. That's about humanity that at the core of that culture, the definition of that culture is values. That a new definition of wealth is not about what we can accumulate and take for ourselves. The new definition of wealth is what we can give away. That's what we believe and that's why we sail. We knew that the voyage would never take place unless we could build the community that could take care of that canoe to make sure that there's a future for these canoes that is embedded in the hearts and the minds of young people. And in the essence, in the end, Hokulea built us. We're stronger now, more committed, and more determined. So we're at the moment of departure. We're gonna leave today, we're not saying goodbye. Because the promise we keep is we're coming home.